Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro, and I sit on the board of trustees of the International Menopause Society, and today we're joined by Dr. Toby de Villiers. Toby, can you introduce yourself to our community of physicians who are joining us? Good day um, to the audience. I'm Dr. Toby de Villiers. I'm a um, past president of the International Menopause Society. I am a gynecologist by trade, but I am also specializing as a bone metabolic expert and spend a lot of my time with patients with osteoporosis and also other hormonal issues. So as we follow our midlife women with increasing risk for osteoporosis, I want to get across the message to our healthcare practitioners that bone health is more than a bone mineral density. So could you talk to us about how you assess or how we should be assessing our patients who are at risk for fracture and that the DEXA is not the only story? Um, a very good question, um, um, Mala. The uh, DEXA is certainly only part of the whole equation. So uh, the first thing is that we have to look at risk factors for fracture. And uh, the most common factor there will be the patient's previous history, especially of a so-called fragility fracture, where they sustain a fracture when falling from own body height. Uh, the second most important is probably a familial history and especially of a hip fracture with either of either the mother or the father, or then just the history of osteoporosis in, in from the maternal or paternal side. Other factors that are important um, will be factors like a low body mass index, people who don't exercise a lot, uh, people with a diet low in protein or with not optimal um, utilization of calcium or vitamin D. And then obviously we have a lot of secondary causes of osteoporosis as well. And um, <clears throat> these are mostly stuff like an early menopause, rheumatoid arthritis, or diseases like secondary hyperparathyroidism. Um, also the use of medications such as uh, corticosteroids. So all these factors have an input into the assessment of a patient for the risk of fracture. Now, the one with probably the best input will be a bone mineral examination, but it always has to be seen in context of the other risk factors. Now, previous years, this was quite difficult in, in, in doing it yourself, but nowadays we have various models, and I would basically only um, encourage you to use one model. That's the FRAX model, um, which is an online model, and it can be be assessed very easily by just putting FRAX on your browser. Um, it is the official one endorsed by the International Osteoporosis Foundation, as, and um, it is exceptionally user-friendly. Um, the app will basically ask you the patient's age, because we didn't talk about that, but that's also a very important factor. Um, it will ask you about the body mass index, it will ask you about any um, secondary factors, also specifically in terms of smoking, which is bad, and uh, um, in terms of excessive alcohol use. If you do have a bone density, the FRAX model uses um, the FEMA neck um, uh, absolute value, not only the T-score, and then it will give you a risk of probability over 10 years. So uh, that is the basis on which we work today is the risk probability for any major osteoporotic fracture on the one hand, or specifically for hip fracture on the other hand. I think it's so important, I think it's so important though, for people to recognize that that minus 2.5 was not necessarily a threshold for treatment, particularly let's say in an older frail woman, a threshold for treatment may be much less. So this model does incorporate those concerns as well and is country specific. Yeah, that's the thing is that unfortunately FRAX doesn't tell us when to treat. FRAX just tells us what the risk is. So it's basically for every country to determine in terms of the fracture epidemiology, in terms of the uh, mortality figures from um, fractures and the cost of medication to determine where uh, treatment should take place. Now that's been done very well in the UK and in some parts of Europe. 
um, in the United States of America, it was determined as what we call fixed values, but that was done about 10 years ago, and it's largely outdated, but it's still widely being used by anybody, so everybody. So that basically says that if the 10-year fracture risk of any major osteoporotic fracture exceeds 20% or of hip fracture 3%, one should treat. So if you haven't got country specific values, that's something to take into account. Uh, but otherwise, if you do have a, a recent fracture, that it, or if you have a value, uh, a T-score at either the spine or the hip, the total or the femur neck of less than minus 2.5, it is probably an indication to think about treatment. But where the FRAX model becomes very um, handy is in the osteopenic or low bone density range, where it will often tell you to start treating far before you get to the actual minus 2.5, as you referred to just now. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and these days, um, we also use this to determine with which treatment we should start. Because as you probably all know, we have the drugs that will be an, a, called an anti-resorber. So they work against the osteoclast, but we also now have a nice array, a three to be exact, of um, anabolic drugs, drugs which actually stimulate the osteoblast. Now, unfortunately, they are very expensive, so we just can't use them. And we've never been actually quite knew where to, to put them in. So these days, by using all these risk factors, and the um, uh, fracture probability over the next 10 years, we can identify the group of patients who are probably better off being treated firstly with the anabolic drugs than followed by a um, anti-resorber. And so I, I want to jump in here because I think it's important the message that you're giving us in terms of the fact that this is a chronic disease and may need sequential medications, but ongoing therapy. We don't necessarily think about treating this as a cure. It's a chronic disease like hypertension or diabetes. Can you comment on that for our healthcare practitioners? Uh, sure. I think that whenever a patient is on therapy, the need for therapy should be reassessed at a one to a two yearly time period, depending on the severity of the disease. But it also depends a lot on the type of medication that you use. If you are using, for instance, a bisphosphonate and you're using the oral form, we generally think that treatment should not exceed five years. Um, and if it's in the intravenous form, such as mazolin, chronic acid, it probably should not exceed three years without an interruption in between or, if necessary, a change to a different drug. Um, on the other hand, if you're dealing, for instance, with denosumab, um, it's different because denosumab keeps on improving the bone density every year. So with denosumab, we do not put a timeline as a limit, but we say that you can treat it to target. And in this instance, it's probably a target of minus 1.5 at your lowest point. So you can treat up to that point, which can be much longer than the five or the 10 years. But when you stop the denosumab, you have to plug it with something like a bisphosphonate or other form of an anti-resorber. Otherwise, you just lose everything you gained in a very short time with an increased risk of fracture. Sort of a, a consolidation uh, of yeah. uh, ending the denosumab with a year of a bisphosphonate. And just one important thing to remember, many of you will not have used the anabolic drugs, um, such as PTH or the, the rosozozumab. Um, the, these drugs can only be used for a limited period of time, and it would mostly be 18 months at the most, or sometimes only one year, exceptionally for two years of length. And the problem is that you have that anabolic window. If you exceed that anabolic window, you'll also start um, stimulating the osteoclasts, uh, which obviously would be counterproductive. So your, your anabolic drugs are for preferably the first part of the treatment a year, 18 months to two years, followed by one of the other anti-resorber drugs. So a lot will depend on exactly what you're dealing with. But you are absolutely right, Mala. It is, it's not a once-off treatment, thank you. Um, it is a lifelong situation which will have to be monitored. 
Now, as healthcare practitioners, you know, gynecologists, primary care, endocrinologists, rheumatologists, we have this focus on bone health. Often our patients do not. When would you tell our practitioners listening to really make sure that they're talking about bone health, putting in a bone plan, including when to screen for risk factors, when to screen for a DEXA? How should they be approaching this? Okay, generally speaking, we're talking to a male patient audience at the moment. It would be at the time of the menopause. Um, time of menopause is an extremely good time to touch on the issues of bone health, to assess all the necessary risk factors. And uh, you can do um, the, uh, uh, um, the FRAX analysis without a DEXA. It, there's a paper model as well. So it's a very good idea to do that. And if it shows up a significant risk at 50, you can also proceed uh, towards a formal DEXA examination. And after menopause, it would be at least every second to third year that you need to talk about the risk factors and assess that you don't have to do a DEXA all the time. Um, a DEXA follow-up will be determined um, individually per patient. It's very difficult to, to get one. Just one word about uh, what about bone health before menopause, in other words, in the premenopausal patient. And there I have a completely different uh, um, angle. I would not deal with bone issues, except if I have a definite secondary cause, which would make me um, go into to bone health because many younger patients are inappropriately um, seen with DEXAs and they then are measured or calculated in the wrong way as if they were menopausal and they get a great fright and even um, medication, which is absolutely not necessary. So just remember in the premenopausal patient, we talk Z scores or Z scores, as you say. And in that context, anything above a minus two point zero Z score would act actually be normal. So I think we, would... we really want to highlight that concept of the worried well, that having access to care does not necessarily mean that you're choosing wisely in the tests that we offer. So I would be worried in the premenopausal patient if you have a definite factor like anorexia nervosa, a, a definite um, disease, or if you're dealing with primary hyperparathyroidism, which doesn't often occur with them, um, but especially so if you have an abnormal history of fractures, because we have a saying that in premenopausal women, you do not treat on DEXA, you treat on DEXA and in the presence of fractures. Right. Each woman is unique. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and really bringing awareness during this particular time about the importance of bone health, osteoporosis, the treatment of care, FRAX, the investigation, a lot for our practitioners to think about. Thank you so much for joining us.